Okay, welcome everybody and thank you so much uh, for joining me and Rabbi Kellerman this afternoon. Rabbi Kellerman, welcome. It's such a, an honor and a pleasure to, to have you in conversation with our community. Uh, you're such a distinguished scholar. I know that you know the South African Jewish community well. You visited here many times over, over the years um, and, and your fame both as an author, a thinker, a speaker, and, uh, and, and really a, an all-round Torah personality is, uh, is, is, some, is something which is, uh, you have made a tremendous impact on our community and on Jews around the world. And so it's such an honor to have you in conversation today. Thank you so much for your time. Rabbi, it's really my honor. You're one of my contemporary heroes and the changes you've made in the world are astounding. So it's, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. So let's, I think, let's jump right in because I think Rabbi Kellerman today is, is a very, very important discussion and, and perhaps uh, maybe the most important discussion of all because, you know, we're just before uh, Shavuot, literally a week away from the festival of Shavuot. And I think what, what, what I'd really wanted to discuss with you today is that Shavuot is not just another festival, it is the, the source and the origin of everything of what it means to be a Jew. And that Shavuot is really an anniversary of a specific event, that this is the anniversary of exactly 3,333 years ago, when God gave us his Torah at Mount Sinai, where he spoke to our ancestors at Mount Sinai, and he said that he is our God. He took us out of Egypt, and this is the Torah that he wants us to, to live our lives by, and he gave us a mission, and that has been our mission as the Jewish people ever since then, but that, the fact that Shavuot is the anniversary of that is actually making a factual claim, and that, that's what I think is so important about our discussion. You know, sometimes we think about festivals, Jewish festivals, well, it's a quaint cultural custom, and it's so nice, and there's milchiks on Shavuot, and we have matzah on Pesach, but every single one of our festivals is making a factual claim about the world, and about our lives, and about reality, and the foundation of it all is the factual claim of Shavuot, which is a factual claim saying that God revealed himself and his Torah to our ancestors, and that he gave us his Torah and his commandments to live by for all times. And, and that, now the, the point is this, either that happened in fact, or it didn't. And of course we believe that it did, but what, what I wanted to, to discuss today with you is how we know that to be true and, and why it's so important. And, and our, maybe our starting point of our discussion here is, is to explore why that's so important. Because you know, in, in a certain sense, it's really everything that makes us Jews. If the, the, the fact that this did take place and that we believe that it did take place infuses our lives with meaning, it means the mitzvahs that we keep, it means our Jewish identity, the continued existence of the Jewish people is part of a divine mission. Everything we do is then infused with the meaning of the fact that God gave us his Torah. And so it, it almost starts with that. This, this concept of the importance of this claim and, and defining Jewish identity is, um, is, you know, is, is, is it as important as I'm saying it is? Is this something that you would agree with? Or, or am I making too much of this? No, Rabbi, it's, your point is well taken and it's absolutely essential. There are two very significant differences uh, regarding whether or not this is true. The differences that would make in our life. For example, uh, each one of us today that has access to the Jewish tradition has it only because of literally generations of people who gave up their lives for this tradition. And had they not given up their lives, we would not have Judaism today. The only reason they gave up their lives was they had absolute clarity that it was true. If they didn't, then when it gets tough, then people give it up. So the first point is that Judaism wouldn't exist for us and it won't exist for our children unless we know with certainty that it's true. Then when it gets tough for us, we'll continue to hang on. And this really leads to the second point, which is that <clears throat> our integrity is fueled by the certainty that this is true. Because if it's not true, then when it's difficult for me, I won't have the strength to carry on. I simply won't have the ability. You know, we see this in, in, in athletics. If the athlete believes that what the coach is saying is true, he can go 42.2 kilometers. But if he doesn't believe that the coach knows what he's talking about, if it's not necessarily true, 
the athlete's going to give up part way. So for my own integrity and for the continuation of the Jewish nation, we have to discover, is this thing really true or not? Every individual has to know that. Yes, 100%. I, I love the way you're putting it from both of those two points. And, and I think just to even uh, clarify and make it more real, when we say that it's true, that means uh, that the Torah being true means God exists. It means that he asks us to, for example, keep Shabbat, give, give charity. He, he asks us to be kind and decent people. He's asking us to keep kosher. You know, the, the fact that th that's what the essence of this claim means is that God is really asking us how to live our lives. And that when we are doing his mitzvahs, this is part of a, an ultimate truth in the world and our ultimate purpose. And that, you know, one day when our, as you know, and part of that truth is that our souls were sent here on a journey from God to do these mitzvahs. And then eventually after 120 years, we go back to him and say, listen, did we do it or didn't we? And, and so it's so important to clarify for the very purpose of our lives, you know, is, is this all real? And, and that's why I thought, you know, I thought it's so important like a week before Shavuot to really clarify this. Also, it means that God has a vision for mankind that we're, we're, we're not just floating here in outer space. There's a beautiful, beautiful goal that mankind can achieve. And God knew when he gave the Torah that his prescription would work. That's very inspiring. We could actually create a perfect world. Yeah. And I think that, as you say, I mean, we, we have mitzvahs, which, which are uh, the 613 mitzvahs, which are applicable to, to the Jewish people, to Am Yisrael. But, but God also gave mitzvahs to all of humanity, mitzvahs, of decency, of respect of human life and respect for property and faith and all of, uh, and kindness to animals. All of these are different elements of, of the morality that God gave to the entire world. So it's not just something which is relevant for us as the Jewish people. Of course, we have our, our special dimension of it. And on Shavuot, God spoke to us directly at Mount Sinai, but it, it has, as you say, this, it's, we're talking about a divine vision for the Jewish people, but for, for all of humankind. Right. This is, as you said, this is the most important question. Yeah. And, and then I think maybe before we even get into it, you know, sometimes when, when people talk about faith, they say, we just got to have faith. I mean, either, either you got faith and you believe in God or you don't, or you got faith that the, you know, the Torah is true or you don't. You know, is, is there a space for rational inquiry? Because essentially our discussion today is about saying that we want to prove to ourselves from a rational point of view that the Torah is true and that God exists and that we believe that the Torah and, and Hashem can stand up to that rational inquiry, but that we, 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 in a certain sense, could say, well, forget about the rational inquiry, either you've got faith or you don't. Is, not, is, is there not almost a breach of perfect faith in going down the path of rational inquiry like we're going to do this afternoon versus just saying, well, I don't need the rational inquiry. I believe because I'm a Jew and I believe. It's interesting. I think the tradition itself specifies the that you should get absolute intellectual clarity as a first step. And then as a second step, we place it into our hearts and then we have perfect faith. And that's so important. Why? Because if you just start with blind faith, you can believe in anything. And unfortunately, reality will come back and bite you. If you believe in something that's a lie, at some point, your lifestyle is going to conflict with reality, and it's going to cause damage. So the first thing we have to do always is clarify, is the path that I'm walking true? Can I verify empirically the path that I'm walking is true? What's the place of, place of faith? Once I've verified that it's true, that's terrific until all hell breaks loose. When, when the world starts to become a very frightening place, when the stress level goes over 10, at that point, your mind stops functioning. And the only way that you'll be able to continue to walk this path is if you can tap into faith and say, once upon a time, I had perfect intellectual clarity this is true. Right now, I don't have clarity about anything, but I remember that I once did. And based on that rooted faith, right, I will now continue to march forward. Yes. And I think that's so important. So really what you're saying, and I think that's part of our journey this afternoon in our discussion, is a question of a two-phased approach. Phase one is rational inquiry because you can't start with the blind faith because then blind faith in what? Then it could be anything. Why choose this and not something else? 
then it could be absolutely anything. So, so we go in to say, we want to understand why this is true. Once we understand that, we've understood it from a rational uh, point of view, then we move on to, to the next step, which is to internalize that from a psychological, emotional point of view, where, you know, in, in, in a sense, um, you know, we have these two words, emunah and bitachon. So emunah is, is that real faith from an intellectual point of view. And then there's bitachon, which is that sense of trust. And, and the world is going through so much uncertainty at the moment and uh, so many difficulties. And, and then people, our, our, our trust in Hashem is stretched to the limit. But if, if it is what you're saying is this, if it's founded on a very uh, powerful intellectual foundation and rational understanding that, of the truth of everything, then our faith deepens psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. And then that faith can carry us through anything of life and we also allow it allows us then to to stay focused on who we are and why we are here so true you see today when people believe in lies how much trouble they get themselves into and you also see people who believe in truth but they don't have the ability to maintain that integrity under stress so as you're saying these two elements are crucial Okay, good. So I think let's let let's begin this this exploration together in our discussion to try and understand uh, where where does one begin, you know? Because I think, and this is why I wanted to have the discussion with you is um, you 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 come from a very interesting background in in that you know you're you're a uh, one of the foremost um, uh, Torah scholars and thinkers and a person who, who's making a huge impact in the world. Uh, but you come from a background of degrees at UCLA and, and Harvard University. You have a lot of um, academic study and, and experience in comparative religion and understanding because every religion makes a claim of truth. Different systems, not only religion, different philosophies make a, a claim of truth. And, and so Judaism is making a claim of truth about the fact that God revealed himself and his Torah. So how, how does one begin a journey like this? Because we're looking at all of these different claims and everyone is very confident in the claims that they're making. You know, so how does one, you know, with, with, with the experience that you've had both in terms of the Torah wisdom and learning, but also the academic background that you have um, and, and the books that you've written on this topic, uh, which I must say are, are outstanding. And, and I've read them both your, your book, Permission to Believe and your book, Permission to Receive. Uh, where does one begin this, uh, this whole journey? I, I, the way that I like to look at it is by taking the big picture first, zooming all the way out and taking a look at all world religions and seeing the common thread that we find in their revelation narratives. What we see is that all religions, almost without exception, begin with a claim that it would be very difficult to check. It could either be God spoke to one person or two people, and then those one or two people related to their followers the contents of that revelation. Or it could be that God spoke to a massive group of people who then disappeared. They're off the planet. They're no longer accessible to us. And the way that we know that they spoke to that larger group is through a tradition delivered by, again, one or two people. But you always end up at these one or two religious leaders uh, who were entirely dependent on for the tradition. There's, there's no way you can get past them to check the tradition. If you look at all world religions, you'll find something like that. Okay. Then you turn to Judaism and immediately you find something that's unique, which is the Jewish claim that 3 million people, an entire nation stood at the foot of Mount Sinai 3,333 years ago. God spoke to them. He said, I'm the Lord your God. You should ignore the gods before me. The Jews there heard God's words. They experienced him. He was manifest inside of them. It was revelation prophecy. They experienced it. They lived to tell their children about it. And their children lived to tell their children about it. And what's so unique is that today, Every single Jew on planet Earth, unless that Jew is a convert or the child of a convert, every single Jew, which would be a minority, every single Jew on planet Earth can trace their lineage within two or three generations back to Orthodox Jews 
who believed with all of their heart and soul this tradition about Mount Sinai. And once they hit that line, then it will be a continuous line going back through history that is verifiable. You can all find in your families who that person was, the last person who believed this with all their heart and soul, and then trace it straight back. So that is very, very unique. You have Jewish groups all over planet Earth, all with the claim that they descended from those prophets. Try to find the descendant of somebody who watched Jesus walk on water. Try to find the descendant of somebody who saw Muhammad fly through the sky. You're going to have a very, very hard time finding that person. Not one on planet Earth. And here we have millions of people who all claim and can verify they are the descendants of this chain of people going back to Mount Sinai. That's very, very unusual. Now, that alone is not proof, but that is the beginning of the process of, of analyzing. In other words, you asked me, what would be the first step? The first step is note this significant difference. Yes, in other words, what, you, what you're saying is the, the significant difference is the nature of the claim and, and also the, 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 the sense of, of people who are still around who are connected to that, who are connected to that claim. Those are the, the, because the nature of the claim is, as, as we saying with Shavuot, we claiming that there were 3 million Jews at the foot of Mount Sinai who heard God say the 10 commandments, I'm the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. So we, we, that, that is the claim. We also, by the way, and this is maybe something that people could even relate to uh, more clearly um, as well from, uh, is, is with the, at the Pesach Seder, we are saying that we are the descendants of the people who left Egypt through those miracles. And, and from Egypt, we went then to, to Mount Sinai. So it, it's, the, it's the scale of the claim and the fact that that claim, you know, is, is traceable back through the generations, literally all the way back. That's correct. Now, at this point, I would say that the argument is, uh, is moving, but not yet compelling, uh, because perhaps there could be some explanation for why the Jews uh, uh, got away with such a claim and nobody else did. But if we dive in a little bit deeper and look at more detail, I think you can see that it's very, very compelling. Uh, let's, let's, let's engage in this sort of an analysis. We have a, a universal tradition among Jews throughout history that their ancestors heard God speak at Mount Sinai. What started that claim? Let's assume well, let's say it this way. There are four possibilities. One possibility is that that claim is true, that God actually spoke to the Jews at Mount Sinai. Let's put that aside for a minute. Let's take the skeptic's perspective. Let's say that, in fact, the claim about Mount Sinai is mythology. It's a lie. It never happened. If the claim about Mount Sinai never actually happened, then at some point, a cult leader or a group of cult leaders must have made a claim about a mass revelation. We know that's true because otherwise, where did this claim about mass revelation come from? Some point, at some point in history, somebody said it. When those cult leaders or that cult leader made that claim, he or they had to place that event somewhere in history. The cult leader or cult leaders had to say, either God spoke to our generation. He spoke to us. We were the ones at Mount Sinai. That would be what I would call the present lie because his claim is the present generation are the ones who heard God speak. Or the cult leader could launch the past lie. The past lie would be, God never spoke to us. It was long ago at the foot of a great mountain called Sinai, hundreds or thousands of years ago, God spoke to our ancestors, the cult leader says, and I am now telling you the story of what happened there. That would be the past lie. Or the third alternative is that the cult leader could say, it wasn't a past generation that God spoke to, and it wasn't our generation who God spoke to. God has not yet spoken. Someday, God will speak to a future generation. There'll be a great mountain, Sinai, the Jews will all gather there, and this event will take place. And meanwhile, I have a copy of the Torah here I'm going to give you, which describes what this event will look like. So when the cult leader gives the Torah, he gives over this tradition about Mount Sinai, he's got to place the event either in the past, the present, or the future. If we analyze each of these scenarios carefully, none of them are viable. None of them will actually work. Just before we, before we get to that, just to, to clarify here for people, the, the essence of what you're saying, and just uh, 
um, you know, correct me if, if, uh, if, if you want to add something further to this. The essence is this. We, we, we know that people and, and within the Jewish people, and uh, we, we can all trace back a sense of a tradition that we come from people who stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. You're saying if that's not true, then how did that enter Jewish consciousness? It would have to enter by somebody coming and trying to sell it to the Jewish people. And we know that we're a very skeptical nation. So, so whoever was coming to sell something that didn't happen, he, the way that he or, or she would, be, would have to try and present it would be based on one of these three misrepresentations, either past, present, or future. Uh, that is exactly the problem. And again, if you look at them, they, they become increasingly non-viable. For example, let's say that a, a charismatic cult leader says, God spoke to all of us. We were all together 15 minutes ago and God spoke to us, or 15 years ago and God spoke to us. So you're going to have a hard time finding a group of people, a large group of people who will believe such a thing. They'll believe that God spoke to me. That's usually how religions start. They'll believe that God spoke to me and my buddy. But that God spoke to every single one of you who's listening to me right now, people would know that that's not true. And they'd be very hesitant to take on difficult or suicidal observances. Another possibility, as I said, is God, the charismatic cult leader could have made a much better case. He could have said, it's, um, it's, it's not that God spoke to us. And that's why you have no memory of this event. It was many, many years ago at the foot of Mount Sinai, God spoke to 3 million Jews. And uh, they all accepted the tradition. They knew that God had spoken. They knew that it was all true. But then there was a terrible, and then insert whatever you want. There was a flood. There was disease. There was a war. And all of these people were wiped out. And this tradition was passed down only to me. And I am now giving the tradition over to you. In other words, there was Moses. There was an enormous gap in history. That gap has to be bigger than just one generation because otherwise all of the cult followers could ask their parents. It's got to be more than two generations because they could ask their grandparents. If it's going to be God speaking at Mount Sinai and you want to make this believable, they've got to say it was 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years ago. That's why none of you have a memory of this in your families. It was so long ago. So there's Moses, there's a gap, and then comes the charismatic cult leader. So the person I like to call Fred, Fred, the one who launched Judaism. So the problem here is that in an otherwise comprehensive Jewish history, where we have records of all of our great leaders and their accomplishments, we know what Moses did, we know what Joshua did, we know what Ezra did, we know all the great leaders throughout history, what their accomplishments were. We do not have any record of, number one, the greatest crisis ever in Jewish history, where for hundreds or thousands of years, no one knew anything about Torah or Mount Sinai. The Jews were completely assimilated. They didn't know about the, the, the entire mythology. And then one person came and spread the word to them and they remembered. That event, that crisis and that savior doesn't exist in our history books. If the original lie would have been Moses Gap Fred, then when he passed that tradition down to the next generation, when he told his followers, they would have said Moses Gap Fred, and they would have said Moses Gap Fred. And we'd have a tradition going down for thousands of years, Moses Gap Fred. And that tradition doesn't exist in Judaism any place. So we know it's not the present lie, because in the present lie, I tell people, you heard God speak, no one's going to believe that. We know it's not the past lie, because if the past lie was told, there would be a story about a gap and Fred. And finally, the future lie, the future lie would be, God has not yet spoken. He says to all of his cult followers, God hasn't spoken. Someday he will speak. So if I tell my followers, God has not yet spoken, but someday he will speak, they will tell their followers, their descendants, God has not yet spoken. And they will tell their descendants, God has not yet spoken. And the tradition would be amongst the Jews, God hasn't spoken yet. Unless at some point somebody jumps up and tells the present lie. Yes. And I think just to, um, to, to add to what you're saying, um, because it's 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 very it's very deep, and I would I would say to people just to it needs time to to really to think about this because on on one level it's so simple and powerful that it's it's uh, it's something where, where, where there's no rational alternative explanation for it, uh, but yet it 
you know, because of its simplicity and profundity, it takes a while to, to absorb, so to think about it. And just to give ways of thinking about it, um, you know, that there are, we, we can trace, we, we've got a way of tracing every generation of Jews from, from now all the way back. Because, for example, uh, the Rambam, Maimonides, who, who lived in the 10 hundreds, more or less, he, he wrote and he, and he drew a, a line of tradition of every um, rabbi who was the, 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 the head of the tradition of the time, naming them, he traced them all the way through the generations from the moment of the revelation of Mount Sinai all the way through till, um, till recorded history until five or six hundred of the common era. And from then you, you have a, a clear line of, of people who are recorded in history. So, and then from the Rambam until today, we can trace. So you can literally trace every generation of Jews from now all the way back to Sinai. There are names of people that we can, that we can do that. So I think that's, that's the, there is no gap in Jewish history. That's, you know, I think point number one. Point number two, which, which is a very interesting, uh, you know, also point is, is, is that if people, and one may, maybe way people that can think about it is that you know, on the night of the Seder, uh, Jews have been having a Seder night uh, for forever. There's no, there is no record in history of a time where we didn't have a Seder night. So when was this, if this didn't happen, that there wasn't an exodus from Egypt? Because I'm, I want to try and give something that, you know, people maybe have a more of a firsthand experience of, and everyone understands and, and relates to the Seder. But when you're thinking on the night of the Seder, and you're saying there were 10 plagues and the splitting of the sea, that it is part of recorded Jewish history that we have been doing seders for thousands of years. There is, there's no point where there was no, there was no seder and all of a sudden it started. It's, it's always been there generation after generation because who would be the first person to introduce the seder and say to a group of Jews, skeptical Jews, oh, by the way, you've never heard about this, but your ancestors were slaves in Egypt. And by the way, there were 10 plagues and the splitting of the sea, but you've never heard about it. And now you're going to have to every year remember an event that you've never heard about until this point. And, and we know as Jews, we're very chutzpah and we challenge everything. So which generation of Jews was going to accept that from that charismatic leader who says, actually, you've never heard about the Exodus and now start keeping a Seder. Like, you know, wh where did that happen? So it's, it's, uh, it's um, I, th I think just to, to, I don't know if that, if that helps uh, strengthen the argument or give it maybe something um, tangible for people to relate to. So powerful. Uh, th that person who created the first Seder would be the second most famous Jew in all of, in all of Jewish history. Moses went up on Mount Sinai, got the Torah, brought it down. And then that person was the person who established for a, a bunch of Jews who knew nothing about it that this had happened. So he would be very famous. We would know his name and we would know the fact that he was the one who introduced it to the Jewish nation, but we don't. By the way, about, about the, the point you made about being able to trace using the Rambam's Maimonides list. Uh, I'll tell you how I discovered that list from Maimonides. I, I had met a great sage here in Israel. His name was Roshomo Volba. And I heard that he had learned in the Mir Yeshiv in Poland under Rabbi Yeruchim Levavitz of Mir. And, uh, and I asked Revolba, where did Rabbi Yeruchim Levavitz get his tradition? Who was his teacher? And he told me he learned from Absimcha Zissel Zayv of Kelim. So I started putting together the biographical notes of all of these individuals, and I was able to put together a chain that went from the man who I was looking at, Roshomo Volba, straight back to Moses at Mount Sinai. Part of it I depend on the Rambam, but it took me two and a half years. I went through the writings of the period in the 1200s, the 1300s, the 1400s, going straight back until eventually the 500s, the right, the Tanoim, the authors of the Mishnah, the authors of, until I had put together a list. Now, this is fascinating. Between me and Moses, there are less than 100 names. There's a, about 100 people between me and Moses. That is astounding. It's really, it's not that far away an event. And we can verify arche, from archaeological sources the Jewish communities existed and were keeping Judaism in all of the strata of that list. So again, where is the person who started this? Where where did it where where was the, the moment of invention? That's exactly yeah. what you're referring to. Yes, it's it, there is no gap here because you, as you say, we can actually account for every generation 
both in terms of our own records as a people, as well as in, in history, we can actually account. There is, there is no gap. And as you say, there is no charismatic person who came and reintroduced it at some point. Sometimes we think, well, something happened thousands of years ago. Well, you could say anything happened, but actually it was exactly 3,333 years ago. And we can trace every generation from here to there. As you say, there's uh, a hundred, less than a hundred names between, between you and Moses. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's mind blowing. Now, I wanna stress that what we're doing is we're bearing one of the three possible explanations for how this could be a lie, which is what I call the past lie, that there was a person somewhere back in history who invented this story and claimed that it didn't happen to his generation, but it happened to a previous generation. That's really the past lie. And that's what we're attacking. I wanna stress again, there are two other possibilities. One possibility is the present lie where a charismatic leader says that all of you heard God speak. You were all the ones who were there, which is, is patently ridiculous. No one's gonna buy that. And then the third possibility is that the charismatic cult leader said that the event hasn't happened yet. Mount Sinai will happen someday. And that tradition was passed down. But if that tradition was passed down, then people today would be saying that Mount Sinai hasn't happened yet. And of course that's not the case. So what's crucial here is if Judaism is a lie, there are only three possibilities. The charismatic cult leader who launched that had to either say, the liar claimed God spoke in the past. That doesn't work for all the reasons we've described. He spoke to this generation in the present. People are not that foolish. Or he will speak in the future, but he has not yet spoken, and we don't have a tradition like that. So now, all three possibilities for this being a lie have essentially evaporated. And at this point, I don't believe we've even begun to tap the power of Jewish credibility. I think there's a far, far more powerful argument, an argument that uh, was launched a thousand years ago, um, and that, that it's worth paying attention to. This is the argument that's often known as the argument of the Kuzari, uh, Levian. And the, the argument, as I understand it, and again, I don't pretend to understand the writings of someone as great as the author of the Kuzari, but my guess is that he meant something like this. Let's say that Kellerman is making a mistake that in fact, there is a way to get away with the past lie or the present lie or the future lie. Maybe it was a, a national drug trip. Maybe it was a thunderstorm, a volcano. Um, maybe it was an evolving mythology. At first they said one person heard God speak, but then that evolved slowly over time. And they said a hundred people heard God speak and a thousand people until eventually it grew to three million. Maybe you could come up with any theory that you like. And perhaps I, as uh, a philosopher, a theologian, a historian, don't fully appreciate the power of these counter arguments, and maybe one of them could have worked. So there's a way to test that. If somebody would, would say there is a way to launch the past, the present, or the future lie, there is a way to make it work, it could easily be done, then I would point out that things that can easily be accomplished happen more than once in history. We know now that the wheel was not invented in one place on earth and then it spread to every place else. The wheel appeared many places simultaneously all across planet earth. And if somebody can think of the idea, then others can think of it as well. So here you get to what I think is the greatest challenge for the skeptic. And I'm saying this from personal experience. I was skeptical. But this idea is so compelling, it's so powerful that it touched me. The idea is, if it's possible to tell a lie about a large group of people hearing God speak, then we would expect to find that all over history and all over planet Earth. We see that with let's say Christianity. Christianity started when uh, Jesus came, told people he was either the Messiah or he told them he was God, depending on, on, on which sources we wanna to point to. 
And that tradition then spread. But the only way that we know what Jesus actually said is through the writings of Paul, who met Jesus for the first time 30 years after Jesus died. Paul had a revelation that he met Jesus long after. And then Paul wrote fragments, and those fragments were passed down for about 300 years to the Council of Nicaea. And the Council of Nicaea, finally, they were assembled into a document, the New Testament. The same is going to be true by Islam. Islam starts with one person, Muhammad, who makes claims, and people believed him. And the same is going to be true by the Mormons. And the same is, you name the religion. All of these religions begin with one or two people having the revelation. If it was possible to get away with a lie about three people or five people or 100 people or 1,000 people or 15,000 people hearing God speak, then what would I expect if I were to make a, a chart showing the genesis of world religions and I had all the world's religions across the x-axis? I would expect this religion to start with 100 people hearing God speak, and this one with 15,000, and this one with 8 million, and this one with 20,000, and this one with 500,000. And there should be all sorts of random numbers. If you could get away with a lie about a group of pe people hearing God speak, you would expect a range of people who heard the initial revelation. And yet, when we look at human history, what we find is that all world religions start with how many people hearing God speak? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Three million, the Jews. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. That's not normal. That's not normal. The reason why all the world's religions have to start with only one or two is because that is a claim that you can get away with. What's the proof you can't get away with the claim of three million? No one else ever did in history. There is no parallel claim. And I think just to, to, to add to that, it is the strongest claim one could make. In other words, I think just to, to, to emphasize what you're saying is that firstly, it's very unusual that it should be and completely unexpected that out of all of the religions in the world, there's only one that makes a claim of its foundations beginning with a mass revelation to millions of people. And, and that in itself is an anomaly. But then to add to that, it is the most powerful claim because when a, when, when a religion or a claim or a philosophy is built on a revelation only to one or two people or three people, that, that, that obviously is a weaker claim to make because then you could say, well, if I, don't, if I don't trust the two or three people who started it, well, then that, that throws into question the entire system. But when you make the claim that it was millions of people, it's obviously the strongest claim. So why would it be that the very, it's, it's qualitatively the most strongest claim that you could make, and yet it is the only religion that makes the claim. So if it's so, if it's so strong the claim, why has, and you could get away with it, why has nobody else made it? Yes, that's very powerful. It is interesting that there are religions that attempted uh, such a claim. For example, there's a number of Hindu sects that have a tradition that a large, group of people, millions, uh, actually between one and three million, gathered at a battle, the battle that's described in the Bhagavad Gita. And, uh, and all of the people who were present on that battlefield saw their chief god descend from the heavens in front of them. So here you have people who are trying to take advantage of the sort of credibility that you're describing. What's so interesting about the claim, though, is that when that God descended, all of those people dropped dead. They all died. None of them recovered. They were all left dead on the battlefield. And the only way that mankind knows the story is that much later, that one God came to a single prophet, told him the story, and then he spread the story to the rest of mankind. So here you have a hybrid. You do have a group that recognized the power, the attractiveness of the Jewish claim, the, the idea that there's millions of people who witness something. But so notably, in order to protect themselves, in order to create some sort of credibility, they couldn't say that all those people lived because people would say, well, where are they? I've never met them. So therefore, it must be that they all died. And we only know the claim 
through one prophet who lived at a later point who was told the story by that god. Yes, and, and I think what, and this, this goes back to your, your academic background, because uh, you, you really, I mean, and, and we have a record of all religions, you know, recorded religions that we have. What, what you're saying is that having studied comparative religion and looked at all of the different systems, Judaism is the only system which is founded on the claim of a mass revelation to an entire people. And, and there is not, there's no other. Is, 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 that, is that correct? I mean, I know you've said it, and I'm just, I'm just bringing it out for emphasis here with your, with your academic background and, and having studied this as, as something formally as part of your own journey in this. So it's true. What I discovered was that the Jews are the only ones who claim that they experienced a mass revelation and lived to talk about it and taught it to their descendants. You do, again, have groups like this Hindu group, uh, or these Hindu groups, there's actually several Hindu groups who share the tradition of the Bhagavad Gita, but they, they have a belief that there was an entire nation who heard God speak, but none of them survived to talk about it. And the, 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 the tradition was only transmitted through one person. By the Jews, that's not the case. I, I have, my, when I, at my bar mitzvah, my father pulled me aside and said, I want to tell you something, we are Kohanim. We are descendants of the tribe of Levi, right? We, we are Kohanim, and I, I need to show you how the Kohanim, how the Kohen blesses the rest of the Jewish nation. And my grandfather stood proudly watching while my father taught me, because my grandfather had taught my father. And my father and my grandfather have a tradition in their family going straight back to Aaron, right? The father of the Kohanim. And in theory, that is traceable. Now, again, I have not traced it, but the key is that I have a tradition that I'm descended from such people. Uh, and that you will not find. You will not find that the people who actually experienced the revelation survived, had children, then gave over that revelation to the children who then passed it to the next generation, to the next generation. And Every, this is what's so impressive, every single person who is participating in this call today, again, unless they're a convert or the child of a convert, and that's a minority in the Jewish nation, they can trace themselves back to a Jew who had this tradition. Because all Jews had this tradition before the 19th century. Everybody had this belief. And we can verify that based on his, his historical documents. Yes. That's an important point, because that means until the 19th century, it was unanimously accepted by, by Jews throughout the world that this was the nature of our tradition and this is where we come from. Um, and I mean, that is, I think that's an important point here to, to, to clarify. Uh, with the 19th century and the turbulence of the 19th century and the emancipation and all the turbulence that Europe went through, there was fragmentation of the Jewish people where, where, many, um, where many lost that. Obviously, as you said, millions have retained it, but until that point, it was completely uh, unanimous right across the Jewish people. And uh, we, can, we can actually go back and study that period and we'll see that the children who rejected the idea of Mount Sinai were rejecting an idea that was being handed to them by their parents. That's very significant. In yes. other words, again, we've established there was a chain going straight down through history. There were individuals in the 19th century who rejected it. There was massive assimilation. But all of those individuals are the first to tell you that, uh, would be the first to tell you that their parents believed in it with all their heart and soul, as did their grandparents and great-grandparents. Yes, and I think your example of the of the of the Kohanim is such an interesting one. I mean, for people, that's another thing that people could relate to. Any person who says, um, you know, that, uh, and I've, you know, my father pointed this out to me a number of years ago, and it's so interesting that you mention it, you know, as a Kohen. But uh, we we not Kohanim, but it's it's something that 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 always um, you know uh, struck him, and and uh, and and it's something you know which 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 we've discussed. But this idea that any person walking around is a Kohen is saying, by saying that they're a Kohen, they're saying they're a Kohen because their father told them they're a Kohen, whose father told them they were a Kohen, and that means a direct line back to Aaron, the brother of Moses, who's described in the, in the Torah 
as the, the founding father of the Kohanim, that God appointed him to, to head the tribe of the Kohanim. So a Kohen is making a, a biological claim that they're a direct biological descendant all the way back to Aaron. To, so it's, 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 it's um, in, in essence, every Jew is making that claim because then we're saying we are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are the descendants of the, of the people who stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. But a Kohen, it's, it's almost even more tangible. And sometimes you can find a person who's a Kohen who's coming from a family who may have drifted with a sense of Jewish identity, but they still know they're Kohanim. And, and that is a, a direct living link of everything that goes back to, you know, to Aaron, the, 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 first, the first Kohen. I'll tell you, genetics is not my arena. I don't really know much about genetics, but there have been some interesting experiments that were done in recent years uh, where geneticists tested the DNA of Kohanim, of people who claim to be the descendants of Aaron, and they found something which they call the Kohen gene. There's a gene that is in common with all these people indicating they all descended from a single person who lived about 3,000 years ago. Um, so the, 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 the boxes all line up. I have to tell you just a personal story. I, I had always wanted to make the, the trip. There's a tradition that Aaron is buried in Jordan. And uh, I, I took a group of my students and about 30 of us traveled through the Jordanian desert. And we arrived at a place which the Arabs claim is, uh, is Aaron's tomb. And I can't describe to you the feeling that I had standing outside of my great, 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 great grandfather's uh, grave. It was, it, it was an astounding moment where the intellectual and the emotional all came together in one very breathtaking experience. And as you said before, it's less than a hundred people between you and Aaron. You know, we, we're talking about thousands of years, but you can actually trace the hundred people from you back to Aaron. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. It's really... I think this is, you know, this is this is very important, uh, very important discussion, and uh, what, what I wanted to to put to you was was this, you know, you went on a journey yourself, and and your journey, you know, was 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 a personal journey of of coming and discovering Judaism, and coming to it from from a rational perspective. Are these kind of thought processes and arguments something that moved you in that in that journey? So I was raised in. Uh, a traditional home. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a strictly observant home, a traditional home. And uh, certainly my parents believed that it was all true, but uh, I was a university intellectual and there was no way that I was going to accept something like that. And, and I was extremely skeptical. Uh, and during my first two years in university, I, I was pretty much convinced that the entire thing was just a lie. None of it was true. But uh, my parents confronted me and asked me questions and I didn't have good answers to the questions. And that led to a process which took about 10 years. And during that 10 year process, I started to examine, how do you know that any religion is true? Now, I can't tell you that any religion is false. I never did the research. But what I can tell you is that when it comes to credibility, there is a chasm that separates the one religion which I could verify from every other religious tradition I looked at. And I, I, I looked at over 150 religious traditions, 150 major religious families. We're talking about thousands of sects and cults. And of all of them, there was not a single one that had any shred of credibility beyond the tradition that my parents were saying, maybe you should take a second look at. So yeah, it was a long path, about a 10 year path. And after about 10 years, I walked away saying, okay, I have clarity. God did speak to the Jews at Mount Sinai. That, that is probably true. And I, at the time I was not observant. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't even keep the few observances that we had in our home. I was not keeping Shabbat. I was not keeping Kashrut. I was not keeping anything at that point. So this wasn't a natural transition for me in my lifestyle, but uh, but it was clear to me that this is this is something that is true. And as as we said at the beginning of the of the discussion, the fact that it's true made all the difference in the world to me. Uh, I 
I believe that reality is our friend. And the more that we're aware of what's true and what's real, then the better lives we'll live. So if this is true, then just like everything else that's true, we have to incorporate it into our lives. Yeah, thank you. I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful way to bring our discussion to a conclusion and to, to an end today. There's so much more to discuss. Um, but uh, I think that it's always bringing us back to where we started in our discussion about the importance of truth, because, uh, you know, there, there's no doubt that Judaism offers us a way of life, which is so compelling. And often we focus on the, the, the incredible quality of life, which it offers that Shabbat and other things offer. Uh, and, and, and what sometimes we're forgetting is the reason that it offers such a powerful quality of life is because the system is designed by God and God designed and created the world around the Torah and its system. And so we, we need to see the, the, the origins of its truth and, and, and to absorb that. And especially now, this is we one week away from the festival of Shavuot to really think that this, this festival is not just a festival, it's, it's really uh, creating and giving the foundations of everything of what it means to be a Jew and, and this audacious claim which, uh, which, which Judaism makes and which has been part of our tradition for all of these years. So Rabbi Kellerman, it's been such a, an honor and, and a pleasure and, and uh, to, to really talk to you today and to spend the time with you. Thank you for, for giving so generously of yourself and your time and your thinking and um, sharing of your own personal journey, which, which I think is so meaningful to me and to, to, to everybody. So thank you so much for your time and uh, look forward to further conversations, please God. Chief Rabbi, my honor, my pleasure. You're an astounding person and uh, to have a few minutes to talk to you is just tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all of you for joining us today in this discussion. I just wanna wish you all a Chag Sameach and, uh, and, and thank you so much for being part of this discussion. We look forward to continued conversations. Uh, have a wonderful week.